So why is Jewish lineage like the powerhouse of the cell? Because like mitochondrial DNA, they're both passed down by the mother. <laughs> We're, I'm still workshopping. It's a hook, all right? Start here. Seven, historical erasure, part two, genetics. So everybody knows that discussing genetics on social media is one of the most fun things there is. Nobody ever misinterprets any papers or popular science articles or manipulates research they don't understand to fit their argument at all. Genetic science is real. It's fascinating. It's still in its infancy. We only just completed the Human Genome Project in like 2003. Genetic testing has helped the world in innumerable ways, in treating disease and in helping people connect with their past if they happen to have an ancestry that they don't know or was stolen from them uh, in cases of indigenous erasure or kidnapped enslaved Africans. It's a very powerful tool that can be very important and relevant and emotional to a lot of people. Aboriginal Australians, in all these cases, usually one of the most useful things about those types of genetic testing is there is a very clear demarcation between prior to colonization and after colonization, prior to the stolen ancestry, the kidnapping and all that. We can put that in a very clear historical context and we can look at the before and after. That does not exist in the Eastern Mediterranean. The Levant is one of the most traversed places on earth, as I've said many times, which is why genetic testing and studies are necessarily going to be more vague and tell less of a clear narrative than one might like. And I'm giving all of these disclaimers before I start showing you that the genetic studies, what we do have in this field, very strongly support the Palestinian narrative and directly refute the Zionist one. It's just very important to point out that arguing any sort of ancient genetics for modern politics is silly. Most people don't understand the articles or papers they're referencing. And because it is still a new science, it becomes exceptionally easy to weaponize by either side of an argument. These next few slides are from an amazing TEDx Boston presentation from a few years ago given by a genetic researcher named Nathan Pearson who happens to be Ashkenazi Jewish. He starts with this image which is made from the genetics of thousands of different human beings sorted into about 10 different genetic pools and then each of those pools assigned a different color. You can see that the regions are labeled along the bottom here. This chunk of this study represents Levantine. I mean, you don't actually have to know which color means what. You can look at the big picture and kind of figure that out, or it's all in the paper. But the main thing to know is that genetics is never the study of absolutes. It's always the story of proportions. And so the, these proportions of these genetic groups by these colors represents Levantine. Here is a cleaned up version of those same genetic pool proportions, except it is from ancient Levantines found in Sidon, from 3,700 years ago. And then here's a similarly cleaned up visualization of Palestinians today. Now, as you can see, in the ancient Levantines, you've got kind of lime green, dark green, and the gold color. And then in modern Palestinians, you have very similar ratios with a little bit of extra red, bright yellow, and pink. So now look back at this image and see if you can figure out where that little smattering of red came from. That is from Northwest Eurasia which is Europe. So we have Levantines with a little sprinkling of red these days, European Jews, which is both Ashkenazi and Sephardi with quite a bit more red, but not nearly as much red as non-Jewish Europeans. What does that mean? It means, again, genetics is not a study of absolutes, but of proportion. Any claim that uses genetics for modern political arguments are icky pseudo-eugenics but we can still extract some narratives from there that help us put together the puzzle pieces of our past. When B.B. Milikowski made this tweet, making it sound as if a study had discovered that all Palestinians descended from Europeans, he completely misrepresented the findings of that paper. What the paper actually said was that within that 3,700 year old DNA, we found a tiny little blip of an immigration or a refugee or something that may have been associated with sea peoples that kind of sprinkled a little bit of extra red into that genetic mix and then completely integrated afterwards. We find that all three Ashkelon populations derive most of their ancestry from the local Levantine gene pool. But that matrilineal DNA joke that I made at the beginning, that is also from a study that found a significant portion of Ashkenazi and Sephardi Jewish people have 
prehistoric European genetic admixture. That was also weaponized against the ancestry of European Jewish people because they said, well, it turns out they're all native Europeans, which is also not true. As we saw in the genetic study, European Jews tend to have, on average, more Levantine ancestry than non-Jewish Europeans, but less Levantine ancestry than Levantine people who stayed in the Levant. There is no doubt that Jewish communities who moved all over the world, including to Europe, intermarried and proselytized. It was originally seen as a way to strengthen the community. Those practices did not appear to become nearly as ostracized until the last few centuries or so when persecution of Jews in Europe really started to ramp up. Point being, all of it is cool history and cool science that has absolutely no relevance to political situations today. First quote from a geneticist, Populations, thus ancestries, are not static through space and time, and no modern groups can be depicted as descending from unique ancestors who once inhabited a single region. Interestingly, all modern Jews and Arabic-speaking groups examined have shown continued ancestry, reshuffling through the last three millennia with diverse ancestry contributions depending on their history of contact with Africa and Europe. Basically, if you're from somewhere and then you move somewhere, you're going to become genetically less the old place and more the new place, but you will still have both, it's just the proportions change. Quote from a geneticist part two, Tom Booth worried that picking apart what the prime minister got wrong about the study would suggest that in an alternate reality where his interpretation was scientifically sound, Netanyahu would be justified in using such a study to support his claims about Palestinian rights. Quote, you just need to condemn any attempt to use a study on the past in this way. The way our ancestors were 4,000 years ago does not really bear on ideas of nation or identity, or it shouldn't in modern nation states. No amount of genetic studies will ever justify the invasion, murder, displacement, and oppression of an indigenous people. And just because I know somebody is going to mention this, no genetic studies are not illegal in Israel, but they are highly restricted for a variety of reasons which are kind of nuanced. I'm not really sure that's a worthwhile pass to run down, but I will say that I think that if the genetic studies better supported the Zionist propaganda, there's a pretty good chance they would not be nearly as restricted. <laughs> Next up, the Muslim conquest of the Levant and closing thoughts on the whole we were here first debate.